How you doing, everybody? Somebody tell me, is this in the Bible? I want to present some questions. I want to present some evidence to you and let you decide for yourself. So many people, they want to debate the word of God. But is debating the word of God scriptural? It is, is it scriptural? So let's take a look at that. Is debating the word of God in the Bible? Since we all claim that we believe the word of God, for the most part, we claim that we are um, Christians. If you're watching this video, you're probably uh, a professing Christian. Hopefully you are truly born again. So we should be able to come together if we are being led by the same spirit and get a understanding of what God is speaking to us. As the Bible tells us that we are supposed to have the same mind, the same judgment. We're supposed to have the same doctrines. Why? Because we are supposed to be being led by one spirit. Now we can all have different views of something but it cannot contradict itself just like you have matthew gives a perspective or a different view uh, mark gives a perspective or a different view uh, luke gives a different perspective and a different view the book of john and so on and so on they don't contradict each other So the question you have to ask yourself is, why is there so much debate about the word of God? Why is there so much debating about it? Do we debate or declare what a chicken looks like compared to a pig? Do you debate that or do you declare it? Do you debate or declare whether water is healthier than alcohol do you debate that or do you declare it now you may be saying these are um menial things or uh, stupid things but how much more important is the word of god compared to what a chicken looks like and what a pig looks like and if you're going to debate over it you know what a chicken looks like you know what a pig looks like you're not going to have somebody come along and tell you that a chicken is a pig and a pig is a chicken. Unless they've been doing some things that they aren't supposed to be doing. Changing things. You know how it says in the book of Revelation. Anybody who adds or takes away from the word of God. Shall be cast to the lake of fire. Shall have these plagues. And the things written to this book. Written in the book. Um, added to them. You're not going to argue about if water is healthier than alcohol. But you will have people that want to debate about that. But I believe that things like that, they aren't debatable. They are declared. I'm not about to debate if alcohol is better than water. I'm going to declare it. I'm not going to debate to debate if I'm married to my wife or not. I know that I'm married to my wife. I have the documentation to prove it and it's written in my heart. It's written in my heart, it's written physically and it's written in heaven. God knows, God saw it. God know the reasons why I married my wife just as he knows the reason why she said yes. But that is something that's not up for debate. Are you, if you're married, are you going to debate if you're married to your wife or your, your husband? Are you going to debate that? If you've had kids, if you've birthed kids and you know those kids came forth from you because you know what happened before that to have those kids, you know, are you going to debate that? No, you're going to declare. You're going to say, I know that these are my kids and nobody can convince me differently. Why? Because it's simply truth. 
and you have an understanding, you have a knowledge. You see, knowledge is something that's intimate. You're intimate with your children. You have knowledge, knowledge of your children. Anybody can watch your children and learn about them, but you have a intimacy with your children. You have a intimacy with your spouse, just as we have a intimacy with the word of God. So the God, the word of God is not debated, but it is declared when we are intimate with it, which is what knowledge is to know. Go look at the root of the word knowledge. It consists of two words, know and ledge. But let's look at the scriptures. Let's look at the scriptures. First Kings chapter three, starting at verse number nine through 12. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people. So we see that understanding and heart are tied together. That I may what? That I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. So the Lord was pleased with what Solomon was asking. But let's see why God was pleased with what Solomon asked. Because Solomon asked for an understanding heart to judge righteously among the people. And God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither has asked riches for thyself, nor has asked the life of thy enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. So Solomon is a once in a lifetime type of guy. But notice that the understanding that Solomon received, it was from the Lord. The wisdom that Solomon received, it was from the Lord. Because that's going to play an important part in this lesson that we are partaking of right now. Isaiah chapter 28 verse number 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? It's a question. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? So when it's talking about he, it's talking about God. It's talking about the Lord God Almighty. So he asks this question, who will God teach knowledge? And who will he make to understand doctrine or teachings? Them that are, them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. So again, we see that it is God who teaches knowledge, it is God who gives understanding of doctrine. But he gives it to those who are mature, who are mature, who are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. A babe isn't going to be able to eat meat like that. They're going to stumble at it. This is why in our, in our ministries, we have to discern how we approach certain believers and see where they're at in their walk so we can know how to nourish them properly. We don't want to give them too much meat and then they can't handle it. We want to grow them in the Lord, in truth, on that milk so they can grow up and get uh, grounded on those doctrines and those teachings and then you um give them the meat this is why you see me uh in a lot of my sermons you see me give a little bit of both so that way everybody gets fed you know i'm trying to give a buffet you come in there you get what you get what you want you get what you need now if you're a babe or whatnot you know god is 
is, is guiding you in what you need to take in and what you can't take in. Job chapter 12, verse 13. With his wisdom and strength, he hath counsel and understanding. With his wisdom and strength, he hath counsel and understanding. Job chapter 20, verse number 3. I have heard the check of my reproach and the spirit of my understanding causeth me to answer. Now listen to what he says. I have heard the check of my reproach. You know what reproach is. So he heard about it and the spirit of my understanding causeth me to answer. So his understanding caused him to speak. He understood the situation he was in. He understood what was going on with him. He understood his reproach and his spirit of understanding caused him to speak. Well, we just saw who gave the understanding. It was God. Job chapter 28, verse number 28. And unto man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. So you have wisdom. And with wisdom, the Bible tells us over and over and over in many passages, when you get wisdom to get understanding. Because a person could be wise but stupid. You'd be like, how is this person so wise but they're so dumb? Because they don't have understanding about what they're talking about. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And once you have that wisdom, you get understanding because you depart from evil. As it says, and to depart from evil is understanding. Because once you have the fear of the Lord, you're like, oh man, oh, oh God. I was on my way to hell. I know the consequences of sin are death. So what do you, what do you do? You depart from evil because you have an understanding that you don't want that. You want life. So you continue to pursue Christ. You continue to walk in faith. You continue to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not in the old ways. Not in the old person that you used to be. Job chapter 32 verse number 8. But there is a spirit. But there is a spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. So the scriptures tell us that there is a spirit in man and God is the one who puts the inspiration in man to have understanding. So what happens when you understand something? You can speak it boldly. You can speak it boldly in faith because you know that it is God. You know that it is the Holy Ghost. You know that it is the Lord Jesus Christ who has given you understanding because you have a personal relationship with the father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Once you have that personal relationship with him, he gives you the Holy Ghost as he promised. Job chapter 33, verse number three, my words shall be of the uprightness of my heart. And my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. And my lips shall utter knowledge, what? Clearly. So when we're speaking of knowledge, when we are speaking of the mysteries of the scriptures, when we are speaking the different things we are um, been given to speak by God, we are supposed to speak them clearly. Why are we supposed to speak them clearly? Because we have an understanding of what we're talking about. Because that understanding has come from God himself. And the Bible tells us that God is not the author of confusion. But of what? Sound mind, sound mind, love, and all these different things. So, we're going to speak personally about me because this is my ministry. When you see me speak, I speak with plain speech. The knowledge I've been given, I speak clearly that even a two-year-old can understand it. 
I lay it out. So I show you what this means, what that means. I tie it together with scripture upon scripture upon scripture upon scripture. Why? So you can't say, oh, I'm still confused. Or I, I didn't get that. Now, yes, there may be certain things that you may not understand. You have to get um, more clarity on. But for the most part, overall, you understand the message that is being presented to you. And if you love truth and truth dwells in you, you have no choice but to understand because God is the one through the spirit that you got through repenting and believing the gospel who is going to give you understanding of the truth that is being presented. This is it's simple when we allow ourselves to be led by the spirit. But sometimes our flesh gets in the way. And sometimes... In this day and age that we're living in, people aren't truly saved. If they aren't saved, that means they don't even have the spirit of truth dwelling in them in the first place to have an understanding of what is being taught and what is being said. Therefore, they end up relying on their flesh. They end up relying on their mind, philosophical, as the Bible talks about philosophy. It warns us against that. They end up relying on that. And they say all the right things, but they don't have the knowledge. They don't have true understanding. As the scriptures tell us, forever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. My wife made a point yesterday, and we was talking about learning and knowledge. And she was like, um, like a two-year-old, they learn the alphabets. They can say the alphabets and stuff, and but then you ask them, what does your name, what letter does your name start with? And they say, they don't know. It's because they don't have a complete knowledge of the alphabet and how the letters correlate with their name and with different words. Now they know the alphabet, they can say the alphabet, they have learned the alphabet, but they don't have a knowledge of the alphabet. The same way people are um, having a people are learning about the Lord Jesus Christ, but they don't have a knowledge of him. They are intimate with who he is, why he did what he did. They don't know him. They can't go before his throne. They can't lean on his shoulder. They can't go into his house and drink his, his sweet tea or his lemonade or his Kool-Aid. You like Kool-Aid? Hey, they can't do these things. They can only learn. They can only learn from the outside. When we learn from the inside and by learning from the inside, we get that intimate intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ, which is knowledge. Forever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth. The Bible tells us, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the word. Psalms chapter 78, verse number five. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. So when God gives us a understanding of, when God gives us knowledge, when God gives us wisdom, when God gives us discernment, when God gives us these different things, we are supposed to make them known to our children, make them known to everybody. And we're going to see that. Now, let's define the word debate because debate can be used good and it can be used bad. And we're going to see that debate. A quarrel, dispute, disagreement, a formal dispute, a debating contest. Um, to quarrel, dispute, also to discuss, deliberate upon the pros and cons of. So these are the different definitions of debate. So you can have a discussion. You can have a, a healthy debate. You can have a healthy discussion 
or you can debate and you can quarrel about it. So we can see how it could be used either way because the Bible defines both ways. We're going to look at that. Proverbs chapter 25, starting at verse number eight, reading to verse number 10. Go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof. When thy neighbor hath put thee to shame, debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself, and discover not a secret to another, lest he that heareth it put thee to shame, and thine infamy turn not away. So what is being said in the scriptures is saying, go not forth hastily to strive. We know what strive is, strife is. Lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof. So he's saying when you're going forth to, to your neighbor, when you have an issue with your neighbor, don't go hastily in strife. Because it's going to end up costing you in the long run. It says next, when thy neighbor have put thee to shame. So you're going to say, oh, I'm going to go put him in his place. I'm going to, you know what I'm saying, go correct this or rectify this situation. Your heart is not right. And then you're, you're the one in the wrong and then your neighbor ends up putting you to shame because your conscience is going to bear witness that you are guilty coming at your neighbor the way that you're coming at your neighbor when you know that you're the one in the wrong. Then it says, debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself. So it says, discuss, or, you know, so you go to your neighbor with whatever the situation is and you debate it, you discuss it with them in a righteous way, not in strife, because you can debate to quarrel or you can debate to discuss the situation to rectify the situation. So it's saying, debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself. You go to him in love and say, hey, Let's sit down. Let's talk about this. Let's see how we can make this right. Because that's what God would want us to do. And discover not a secret to another. So it's saying, don't go to somebody else and, you know what I'm saying, talking about it or whatever. You know what I'm saying, you tell, them, you tell them the situation. Instead of going to your neighbor and you talking bad about your neighbor when you know you're the one in the wrong. Or just in general, you go going telling everybody else instead of the person who you need to be going to tell. Or need to go talk to about it. And then it goes on to say, um, lest he that heareth it put thee to shame and thy infamy turn not away. So you're going to somebody else. You're telling them about the situation. You're talking about it like, yeah, man, my neighbor didn't did this to me, whatever. Blase, blase. You know, I was in the wrong, but shoot, he shouldn't have did this or she shouldn't have did that. You know what I'm saying? Bump them or, you know, stuff like that. We see it all the time on Facebook. We, if we were honest with ourselves, we didn't done it before. I've done it before myself. Instead of doing the righteous thing and saying, let me go talk the to them about this so the situation can be rectified the correct way. So what ends up happening is the person that you go run and tell, as it says, um, and discover not a secret to another, you end up going to tell that person and they end up, because their heart isn't right, talking about you too behind your back or not giving you the proper wisdom knowledge and understanding that you need but guess what they can't give it to you if they aren't um intimate with god if they don't have a personal relationship with god they can't give it to you they can give you what they've learned but they can't give you what they don't have they can't give you wisdom from god if they don't have god dwelling in them so they give all this uh, philosophy. It sounds good, but in the end of the day, it ends up hurting you because it ends up making you rely on your thoughts and what you can think about instead of relying on God. But once God gives you wisdom, you know that you can rely on that because you know it's from God and you're not, you're not relying on your mind personally, but you're relying on the mind of Christ. So it goes on to say again, Let's see that here it put thee to shame and thy infamy turn not away. Now let's define the word infamy so we can get a better understanding of what this scripture is saying. Public disgrace. And that's just a simple definition for infamy. So let's read it again. Lest he, well, let's go back up and discover not a secret to another. 
lest he that heareth it put thee to shame and thine public disgrace turn not away. So you went and told this person, instead of going to your neighbor and debating it healthily, righteously, you, you know what I'm saying, going to him, cause, the Bible says, don't do that. That was the first part of that scripture. Don't do that. But instead of going to him, your neighbor, with the situation to rectify it, you went to another and told the secret about what was going on between you and your neighbor. And then that person went and told everybody else and your infamy, your public disgrace was not turned away. So they basically went and told everybody else. It's the, it's the exact same thing you see on Facebook. Oh, they told my business this and that, blase, blase. They running, running and telling. They say, run, run and tell that, run, tell that. It's really a play on words because people are always doing that. You know, You're like, okay, you want to tell it? Then I, you know, I'm going to put it out there for everybody. Now run, tell that. Some of you have um, seen that. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But uh, it's it's just slang or whatever. Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 29. Now this is where debate is, is bad. Because in the context of the scriptures, it's talking about um, those who are given over to a reprobate mind um, to uh, do sodomy and all these different things. And those who... Um, take pleasure in those who are doing these different things. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, you see, he speaks about knowledge. Let's read that again. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge and their knowing in their intimacy, because when you allow somebody in your heart, that's intimacy. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. So, there we have the whispers also, which ties into what we read in the previous scripture. They going around telling the secrets. They going around telling the things that aren't supposed to be told to everybody. So we see that debate can also be used in a negative way. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 20. For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. So again, we see that debating can be used um, for, for, for evil, which is what you have today. Majority of the time, people don't want to debate so you can get an understanding of the scripture. They don't want to discuss the scriptures. Saying, hey, let's debate. Let's come together. Let's read the scriptures. Let's see what you got. Let's see what I got. And let's come together and get a, a better understanding. They want to say, no, let's come together and let's debate the word. Let's quarrel about it. Let's cause confusion. That's what they want to do. And that is wrong. That is of satan let's look at the word declare declare means explain um make clear reveal disclose announce uh or clarify so you hear me say it, truth is not debated it is declared truth or the word of god or Jesus Christ. God is not debated. What God has given us to speak. When we have that true understanding. When we have true knowledge. When we have true wisdom. When we have true discernment given from God. It is not debated. It is declared. It is 
explained. It is made clear. It is revealed. It is disclosed. It is announced. It is clarified. When I'm teaching about doctrines, like the doctrines of baptism, water baptism, Holy Spirit baptism, and the difference, that's not something I'm debating. I'm declaring to you what it means. Now, if you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, then he's going to bear witness to that. Yeah, that's true. Because that's what teachers do. That's what preachers, preachers are supposed to do. They're supposed to give clarity on certain things. So you can go out and do what? You can bear fruit and do the same thing. Give clarity to others so they won't be deceived. So there won't be debating. So we can all be on one accord. Because we're all being led by the same spirit, right? And God isn't the author of confusion, right? So if God is not the author of confusion, then why do we have so many people claiming that they are born again, but they have different, complete, com complete polar opposites of doctrines? You have one group saying that water baptism is a requirement for salvation. You have another group saying that water baptism is not a, re a requirement for salvation. You have one group saying that you know what I'm saying? Once you are saved, you're always saved, but you can continue sinning. You can, it, I'm under the blood, so I can do what I want to. You have one group saying that once saved, always saved is a lie. You have another group that says once saved, always saved is true, but it's not a license to sin because if you're born again, the old person is dead. Why? Why we can't all be on one accord? Because not everybody is saved. Not everybody is born again. Once saved, always saved. If you heard me say, once born again, always born again. You can't be unborn by the Spirit of God. You see, I try to minimize the opportunities for Satan to cause confusion. This is why God gives me these different things. So you can therefore add it to your artillery, add it to your weaponry. Because once saved, always saved, the Satan can take that and he can try to manipulate it, right? But he can't manipulate once born again, always born again. There's no possible way a person can manipulate once born again, always born again without completely making themselves look like an utter fool. Leviticus chapter 23 verse 44. And Moses declared unto the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. Where did Moses get the feast of the Lord from? He got it from the Lord. And what did Moses do when he got it from God. He declared it. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 5. On this side Jordan. In the land of Moab. Began Moses to declare. This law saying. Where did, where did Moses get the law from? He got it from God. When he got it from God. What did he do? He declared it. Simple stuff. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verses number 12 through 13 and the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no multitude, excuse me, but saw no similitude. Only ye heard a voice and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even 10 commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. So this is just confirming what we've been reading. God declares things. He doesn't debate it. He declares his word. <clears throat> First Chronicles chapter 16, verse number 24. Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. Job chapter 13, verse 17. Hear diligently my speech and my declaration with your ears. Job chapter 15, verse 17. I will show thee, hear me. So we got to hear first. A person has to hear. And then once they start to hear, you declare what you're supposed to declare to them. I will show thee. You're showing somebody, you're giving them what? You're giving them clarity. You're giving, you're revealing something to them. Let me show you what this means in the scriptures. 
I will show thee. Hear me, and that which I have seen, I will declare. You can only show somebody in the scriptures what you know. If you don't have an understanding of it, you can't give it to them. Because now you're being deceptive and there's confusion in the mix. There's certain things in the Bible that I don't completely understand. So guess what? I don't completely teach on them. I teach what I know. I teach what I'm intimate with. I'm intimate with the gospel. I'm intimate with Jesus Christ. I'm intimate with what CRISPR is. I'm intimate with water baptism. I'm intimate with um what speaking in tongues are. I'm intimate with the doctrines. I'm intimate with the milk of the word. I'm intimate with the meat of the word that God has given me. Some things I'm not as intimate with, but I'm getting there. I'm growing in those things as God gives them to me. And once he gives them to me, guess what I do? I give them to you so that you can grow that you can be intimate with these different things. You can be more intimate with the word of God. So your faith can be that much more stronger. Your faith is stronger. Then you're going to go out and you're going to walk boldly. You're going to declare what you know. You're going to declare what you are intimate with. Oh, I'm intimate with what the gospel is. I'm intimate with the blood of Jesus Christ. Why? Because you know that you, you've been washed in the blood. You know that the gospel dwells in you. It's written in your heart. So once something is written in your heart, it's there, it's engraved permanently, forever, eternal life. It cannot be changed. Psalm chapter two, verse number seven. I will declare the, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. That's a declaration about who Jesus is. The son of God, the son of the living God. It's not a debate. It's a declaration. Psalms chapter nine, verse number 11. Sing praises to the Lord, which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. We are supposed to declare the gospel. We are supposed to declare the different things that God has done in our lives. We are supposed to declare that God has raised us up from the dead. That he has made us alive. He has quickened us with his spirit. Through our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Psalms chapter 22 verse 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Psalms chapter 30, verse number nine. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? So he's saying, you know what I'm saying? If I die, Lord, you take me out, then I can't, I can't praise you to, to the people. We are the ground and pillar of the truth. The church is our job to declare the truth. Psalms chapter 66, verse 16. Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. Are you declaring what God has done for your soul? That he has cleansed your soul by the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, I don't care what anybody is saying. I don't care what type of false doctrine, false teachings are out there. I know what I know. I know that I have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. I know who I used to be. My testimony speaks for itself. If I want to go out and be a millionaire by doing evil and wicked, guess what? I can do it. If I want to go out and be a millionaire and do it, maybe do it the right way. I can do it. But I choose something else. So the question you have to ask yourself is, why would I walk away from a luxurious lifestyle? You've seen the lifestyle that I used to live. The fancy cars, the fancy clothes, the rims, the money, all these different things. That stuff costs money. That's what I desired to have. 
living in five bedroom, three bathroom houses, living in these big houses and stuff. I've lived that lifestyle. So you have to ask yourself, why would I walk away from a lifestyle of that when that is the American dream? If there wasn't something better, well, there is something better. His name is Jesus. Nobody can tell me different. I don't care. I don't care if the whole world is against Jesus. You can guarantee that I'm going to stand with what I am intimate with, with what I know. And that is, I am born again by God's grace. I'm born again because God opened his eyes, opened my eyes to who he is. He opened my eyes. To how evil and wicked I was in the path that I was going down and what it was leading to. You see, so many Christians claim to be Christians, but they have no testimony. No true testimony. They have a testimony that sound it sounds good because of what they've learned, but they don't have a knowledge. Come and hear. Come and hear. Come and hear. Go watch my testimony video. Come and hear, ye all ye that fear God. And I will declare what he have done for my soul. Psalms chapter 71 verse 17. Oh God, thou hast taught me from my youth. Okay. He has taught me from my youth when I was a babe. The Bible says what? Unless you have the faith of a child, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. If you don't enter into the kingdom of heaven, you don't get the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom that saves you. So when our faith is as a child, guess what happens? God grows us. He teaches us different things. So, oh God, thou hast taught me from my youth. You taught me that everything that I know, Lord. And hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. A child grows up. He starts to learn different things. He starts to become or she starts to be intimate with the different things. That their parents teach them. And they do what? They declare these things with how? How do they declare? With their life, with their words. If a child is raised by Satanists, guess what? The fruit is going to be Satanism. You're going to see it in the child's words. You're going to see it in the child's life. You're going to see it in his action, in his deeds. If a child is raised in a in a true by true born again believers, parents. Then you're going to see it in that child's words. You're going to see it in that child's actions and deeds. So those of us who have been, have been born by the word of God, as the scripture tells, the word is the seed is the word of God and it is incorruptible. And we are born again by the word. God is our father. And what do we do? We are doing the things that our father has taught us. The words that he has taught us and they manifest in our, in our words that we speak. They manifest in our actions, in our deeds. And we are declaring his wondrous works that he has worked in what? In us. Just like Satan works his works in his children. God worked his works in his children. Psalm chapter 73 verse 28. But it is good for me. To draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God. That I may declare all thy works. So once you draw to God. Draw near to God. Because he draws you first. And then you have put your trust in the Lord God. Then you can declare all his, all his works. Not before. Because if you do it before. Then it's vanity. Psalms chapter 96, verse number three. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. 
Psalms chapter 118 verse 17. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. You see, I'm born again. I'm going to live forever. And forever, I'm going to declare the works of the Lord. I pass from death. And the point of this whole ministry is to hopefully get to get you to pass from death to life. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm simply declaring what God has made known to me. It's not up for debate. It's not up for debate. Again, if I'm not sure about something, I will let you know. You hear me say it over and over again. Hey guys, hey girls, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just putting this out here to give you something to think about. These are just some thoughts I had running through my mind. Compare it to when I'm giving a sermon, when I'm preaching boldly, when I'm preaching in the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when I'm preaching in the authority of the power of the Holy Ghost, you know this. That's not up for debate. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 21, verse number six. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, go set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. The Lord has spoke to him and told him to go do something and he did it. He told him to go do something. He told him to go set a watchman and then the watchman was supposed to declare what he saw. How many people are declaring what Satan has told them? Thinking that it's from God. You may be saying, well, no, 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 that's, that's not true. Well, the Bible says that many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus' disciples asked him how many there be that be saved. How many are there going to be that be saved? And Jesus said, few, few. So if there are a few or a very small number of people overall that will be saved or are saved. We can say are saved because their names were already written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world or before the foundation of the world. Then how many people are there that are going to be caught up? <laughs> Think about that. If there are a few people that are saved overall, out of the whole population of people to ever walk this earth. How many people are truly going to be saved right now? Which is the worst time before the worst time ever. In, re in regards to deception. Then how many people are there going to be that are caught up? Acts chapter 20 verse number 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole, unto you all the counsel of God. I'm going to give you all the counsel of God. I'm going to give you what you want to hear and I'm going to give you what you don't want to hear. I'm going to give you stuff that's going to rub you the wrong way. It may burn a little bit. It may cut a little bit, but guess what? It's good for you. Just like, when I was growing up, we had to take cod liver oil. And I didn't want to take that stuff because that stuff is nasty. But guess what? My mom made me take it because it was good for me. And guess what? Today, I take that cod liver oil because I know it's good for me. She made it known unto me that, hey, you may not like this, but I know better. So I'm going to give you this and I'm going to give you understanding. You need to take this because it's good for you. It's going to help you get through what you're going through. So I'm declaring all the counsel of God to help you get through all the deception that is going on in this world. Not just a part of it, but all of it. Some messages you aren't going to want to hear, but you need to hear them. Some messages are going to cut so deep that you, you know, you're going to reject it at first. But if you have the spirit of God dwelling in you, you're going to accept it eventually. Because God chastises his children. And I'm not exempt from that. There are messages I listen to and they cut deep. 
Well, I got to go pause and go sit in the corner somewhere <laughs> and talk to the Lord. Like, Lord, that, that cut. That cut, or I may be watching the video and it cut right there. I'd be like, ooh, ooh, that cut. I may not want to hear it, but guess what? I need to hear it. God wants me to hear it at that particular point in time because maybe I got some things going on in my life that I'm not seeing. And he's rectifying it right there. He's saying, hey, you've been, you've been doing this and you shouldn't be doing it. Let me chastise you. You haven't been judging yourself. As the Bible says, if we judge ourselves, then we wouldn't be judged. Why? Because each and every one of us that is born again, we have the spirit of truth dwelling in us. So we're supposed to judge ourselves. But when we don't judge ourselves, God sends other people that have the spirit of truth dwelling in them to correct us. And then we continue to reject what they've told us. As the Bible says, you're supposed to send, send one person. They reject it. Send two people. They reject it. They got to go. They got to go. That's what the Bible teaches. Rather, it's out the church into the hands of Satan so they can learn a lesson or rather it's out this world. You see, a lot of people don't understand the power that we have, but you got to know how to use that power that God has given you. The Bible talks about believers asking for forgiveness on the behalf of others. But that's getting into a whole nother lesson. But I encourage you to go research and check these things out. Search the scriptures daily for yourself. That's the whole purpose of me putting out these different things. I put it out there to give you something to think about. Say, oh, what's he talking about? Let me go check it out for myself. Romans chapter one, verse number four. And declare to be the son of God with power. So when we are declaring something, it's supposed to be with power. Why? Because the Holy Ghost is the power. The Holy Ghost is who raised Jesus up from the dead. The Holy Ghost is God. Three distinct persons, one God. The Godhead. For those who don't like to use the term Trinity, we can use Godhead because Godhead is, is, is in the Bible. But it's talking about Jesus. Jesus and declare to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So again, when we are declaring something, it's supposed to be with power, which really leaves no room for debate. Romans chapter three, verse number 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. You see, a lot of people want to remove the blood. Don't nobody want to hear about no blood. You know, the heretic Miles Moreau, who died in a plane crash. He didn't make it. He didn't make it. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. First Corinthians chapter two, verse number one. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency, excellency of speech or of wisdom. So he's saying, when I came to you, I didn't come with, you know, saying my speech being perfect. I didn't come with my wisdom being perfect. He said, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He came declaring unto them the testimony of God. The testimony of God is what? The testimony of Jesus, the gospel. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse number one. Moreover, brethren, I declare. No, let's, let's back up. Let's read it again. Moreover, brethren, I debate unto you the gospel. Doesn't say that, does it? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye Stand. Revelation chapter 10, verse number seven. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. 
as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. God declared the mysteries of God, the mysteries that are contained in the scriptures. He declared it to his servants, the prophets. So are there prophets still around? Yes, the Bible does teach this. The Bible also tells us that the, uh, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. But do we go around calling ourselves prophets? No, we don't. We don't. We are, we're servants. We, we humble ourselves. So the Bible again tells us that there are prophets. This is speaking in Revelation. And it's talking about the seventh angel speaking. So we know there are still prophets today. But you have to, to discern who are the true prophets. Those who are declaring what God has given them to declare. So in conclusion, why is there so much debate about the word of God? Simply because people don't have an understanding of what they're teaching or preaching because they don't have the spirit of truth dwelling in them. They aren't born again. And even if they are seemingly making a declaration or declaring what God has said, you have to have the spirit of truth dwelling in you to know if what they are saying is true or not. Because Satan makes declarations too. But God's declarations override Satan's declarations. So um, God bless each and every one of you in Jesus Christ's name as always. Stay focused for Jesus. <laughs> do I have to say it? I think I do. Truth is not debated. It is. God bless you.